Good morning. It is so good to see each one of you out today. We have a beautiful day. It's cooled off a little bit, hasn't it? So praise the Lord for that. We do welcome you this morning. It's good to have each of you here back in the services. And we're honored to be able to come together as the Lord's servants to uh, just praise and worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, if you're new among us, uh, we're excited that you're here to worship with us and pray that you'll feel comfortable and experience the very presence of our sweet Lord and Savior and the sweet Holy Spirit and pray that you'll come back again and worship with us. Uh, do pray for Centennial Church, our sister church this week. Uh, place the tithes and offerings, of course, in the basket in the back. We're not passing the plate, but we're just putting the basket in the back and drop your tithes and offerings in that. Uh, business meeting will be Wednesday following our prayer service. Uh, we will gather again Wednesday night. We've been gathering on Wednesday nights. We have our prayer time and Bible study. And uh, if you're out and about or can make that, we'd love to have you to be a part of that. We enjoy our time together with the Lord. Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Ministry is collecting in August school supplies, notebooks, coloring books, notepads, drawing paper, pencils, pencil sharpeners, stencils, crayons, colored pencils. Uh, stickers, rulers, and other items for back to school. And so don't forget to be a part of that. Uh, bring those items in. Sister Judy and those that work in that ministry will make sure they get put in the boxes and get prepared to get sent out to the children across the entire world. The church voted to begin a digital sign fund. Uh, we're working our way toward meeting our goal and uh, continue to pray about that and see if God would have you to give more toward that or just continue to Keep it in prayer and ask God to help us as we continue to work toward, <coughs> excuse me, getting that, reaching that goal that we might get our sign put out. And <clears throat> as I mentioned, it'd be just another tool uh, for us to minister to the community by. Uh, open prayer time. Uh, don't forget that on Tuesday mornings. Uh, I mention that to you every Sunday, but it's a vital time for us as God's people to come together. Thank you, brother. <coughs> to come together and uh, be in prayer for our families, for our church, for our country. Uh, we have some really wonderful times on Tuesday morning in the conference room off the pastor's study. So if you uh, can and have a time to be a part of that, we'd love to have you be a part of that. Don't forget our bags of hope food pantry and uh, other opportunities as they come about. We'll inform you, but right now we're just meeting on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, and Wednesday nights. And we're not having Sunday school at this time, but we'll inform you as time goes along as to when we might be able to get back to having Sunday school. And just want to praise the Lord that we can come together and meet together and worship our Lord. And so I thank God for this opportunity. I am glad that you're here this morning. It's good to see each one of you. Are you glad you're here? Amen. 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 Good. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Bless you, brother. Praise the Lord. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Let's go to the Lord and ask God to bless our time together today and being here in his house. Our Heavenly Father, as we humble our hearts before you, we just come thanking you and praising you today, Lord. God, you're such an awesome God. You're an all-loving God. Father, we know that you, a long time ago, sent your Son and shared your heart with us through your Son on the cross of Calvary to die for our sins, to shed your blood. <coughs> Excuse me, that we could have... Our sins forgiven and have eternal life, Lord. Father, it's a hope that we have in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And we just thank you and praise you for that. I thank you for those that have come out today, Lord. I thank you for those that are here to play the instruments. I pray your blessings upon them. Lord, we pray for Brother Ronnie this morning. Uh, Sister Doris has contacted us and said that he wasn't feeling well today. So we do ask that you be with him and bring healing upon his body. Father, for those that are sick in nursing homes and hospitals, those that are shut-ins, Father, those that are sick and facing surgery, uh, such as Sister Shelby Jean, uh, Lord, we lift them up to you and pray your divine will be done. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for the privilege that we have to come into this most comfortable place to worship our Lord and Savior. Father, may you allow us to experience the sweetness of the Holy Spirit here this day. Father, may all that we do this day be to honor you. Father, in what you do, we'll be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>
We have changed our songs a little bit from what was in the bulletin. So if you turn with me to page 132. 132. Let's stand, please. And bear with me, please, as I try to lead you this morning. in the blood, isn't there? Amen. Let's turn to page 335. 335. Standing on the promises.
praise the Lord. Turn to 546. 546, please. Love lifted me. If there's anything that can lift us, it is the love of Christ in it. Amen. Love lifted me. Let's sing out. seated please amen praise the Lord you all doing great you are too turn with me this morning to the book of Thessalonians 1st Thessalonians 1st Thessalonians we'll begin with chapter 1 Verse 1, we'll read the first 10 verses. 1 Thessalonians. When you found your place in the scripture of 1 Thessalonians, if you would, on behalf of the authoritative word of Christ, the infallible, holy word of God, thus saith the Lord, verse 1 from 1 Thessalonians, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God 
and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word of much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Caia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Caia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Let's pray, please. Our Heavenly Father, in this quietness of the moment, we just want to come thanking you and praising you for the breaking of the bread. Well, God, we thank you for the precious word of God. God, I come right now asking you to cleanse me by the power of the blood and wash me through and through to just make me your vessel today. May I be your mouthpiece, Lord. Father, may you set me aside and use me for thine glory. Father, I pray that as we've gathered here today in the name of Christ to worship you, Lord. That, Father, we know that Satan would love to hinder this service. That, Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ for the power of the cross and the blood on it. I pray, God, that you'd remove and bind Satan from every heart, from this premises, that, God, you might have your way today. That, Lord Jesus Christ, you, sweet Holy Spirit of God, might walk up and down every pew, might knock upon every heart's door, might... Bring us to the understanding, Lord, of why we're here. Father, sometimes we come not actually realizing and understanding our purpose for being here. God, I pray today before we leave this place that you would speak to hearts, that you would help us with understanding, that you would give us insight, that we would gather discernment from the sweet, sweet Holy Spirit of God. God, I pray your blessings upon this. I pray that you would remove me and just let me have that out-of-body experience and that you'd speak to our hearts from your word. God, I just pray right now that if there's one or more in the building that's never trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that if they've never confessed their sins and invited you to be Lord, I pray that today is that divine appointment for them. I pray, oh God, that you'd have your will and your way now. We'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for what you do. For we ask it in the sweet, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Marks of an effective Christian. That's what we're going to look at today from the book of Thessalonians. It's a beautiful book in the Bible. Of course, I say that about every book. Every book of the Bible is a beautiful book because it's God's holy word. But the marks of an effective Christian, uh, maybe by the end's day, for the end's hour, if we get out in an hour, we'll get to look at ourselves and to see how effective we are as God's children today. You know, that was one of the things I think that God desired, that Paul, I know, desired from what God had taught him and what God used him to teach others to bring about in the lives of those that he had come to and established in the churches and mentoring those that he loved and becoming the father to Timothy being a spiritual father that is that he was and was the desire that he learned the desire that he was an effective Christian that he had the marks of an effective Christian and we might find that today but here one by one as they walk across the yard you might say with the leaves crumbling under their feet with the preacher's words replaying in their minds as they take one last look as they enter the casket to look at their loved one, death has torn a family. The enemy has somewhat shattered the family relationship. The enemy has left them in a state of loneliness with tears 
but yet precious memories. Persecution was taking place during the time of Paul writing this, and the church was two to three years old, and with the church being two to three years old, it's like any young Christian. It's like the disciples when Christ was discipling them. They were still young in the faith and hadn't come to understand or learn everything that God wanted them to learn and understand. And so the church was young and they were confused. These Christians, early Christians were confused because they hadn't really come to understand everything. Had the misunderstanding of the Lord's return for one thing. They thought he would return quickly after Paul had emphasized that the Lord was going to return. They thought he was going to return quickly. Their loved ones, some of them had died. They expected Jesus to return before they had died. But when burdened with grief or overwhelmed with sorrow, take hope in the reality of the return of Jesus Christ. Take hope in the reality of his resurrection. Take hope in the reality of eternal life. Because it's what Paul faces here in writing these believers, Paul yet reveals a very absolute truth. And that absolute truth is that a truth that shatters the, imp the impressive, oppressive gloom that they were in during that time. You know, any time, you know, we talk and just saying about love lifted me. Any time we're in that state of gloom, any time we're in that burden of sorrow, uh, we can look to the Lord Jesus Christ and as a child of God, we can be encouraged and not discouraged by even the things that are going around us, on around us, or the things that might discourage us, but we can be encouraged from this oppression that comes upon us. Paul also reveals that death is not the end here, that Christ is the victor over death itself, reveals hope of the resurrection through Jesus Christ. Do you remember what he said to Martha and Mary there in John's Gospel, chapter 11? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He that believeth and liveth in me shall never die. Believest thou this, he said? And she said, Yea, Lord, I believeth that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. You see, we need to cling to that hope in the time of oppression, in the time of gloominess and so many of his followers had died under persecution they had died in different manners some had died by stoning some had died by beating some by torture some by even crucifixion but zealous jews had done this and even paul himself before he had become a believer in jesus christ was one of those zealous people that were persecuting the christians the angry greeks were a part of it the ruthless roman authorities uh it sort of reminds me today, you know, I don't want to get into politics and I'm not going to get into politics and regardless of politics, you know, in today's world, we're seeing people being persecuted for various things. People being persecuted for standing up for what they really believe. And it's really shameful that a person stands up for what they believe and they're persecuted for it because it's of the moral principles in which they stand on from the word of God. It's sad today. The people are living by that standard, and yet there are so many people, just as these ruthless Romans and the angry Greeks and the zealous Jews, there are those kind of people today that are out there that are willing to go to no extent to harm you, to hurt you. It's all, again, just a part of Satan. It's a part of that enemy that we talked about last week or the week before. I can't remember from the book of Ephesians in chapter 6 that a darkness of the rulers of this world, the principalities that are about us, but Paul, and the point to make here is to be a true follower meant to be willing to give up everything even at the cost of death. I wonder if it really came down to it. And I know sometimes we might just temporarily think about that, but have you ever just really meditated upon that, that my faith would be strong enough or is my faith strong enough that I would be willing to sacrifice Myself, I'd be willing to go at all costs, even if it was at the cost of death, to do something. I know, and I might mention this again tonight, but I was talking to a couple of, well, I was talking to one of my friends down in Paducah, Kentucky, from the church back down there just this week, and she made mention to me, we were making conversation, and she was talking about some things, and things that are going on in her day, and she said, real then, she said, I'm concerned about my husband. She mentioned his name, and I said, why are you concerned about him? She said, 
He's weak, Brother Lynn. She said, he's weak. She said, he will just stand up and allow anything and compromise for whatever is being told and whatever he thinks he needs to do, he'll just do it. He's weak, Brother Lynn. She mentioned that two or three times. My friends, we, as we talked about last week, we need to stand strong in our faith. We need to stand strong in the Lord. And it's a time for us to do that. And that's what Paul wants us to do. And Paul established this church on his second missionary journey. Uh, Paul was making his journey. Remember the Macedonian call? And he went to Philippi and met Lydia and went to Philippi and established the church. And from Philippi, he went over to Thessalonica and established the church here. And here's he's writing to him after two or three years. And Thessalonica was the capital, being the largest city in Macedonia. It had a major highway that ran through it and it had a, a seaport. And so it became a wealthy city. And, and there's some danger in that, by the way. There's a, some danger in being a wealthy country. There's some danger in there being major routes into your country and major seaports into your country. And prayerfully, I'll share a little bit more about why that is so dangerous in a little bit. But Paul knew what was going on. The international trade brought lots of pagan religion in. I mean, maybe we don't think about that sometimes. But international trade brings a lot of paganism into your country. I want to stand here and tell you today, I believe in all my heart that there's been a lot of paganism brought into the United States of America today from international trade. Amen. There's too much paganism in our world. And we're falling for it, compromising to it. Lots of influence comes, my friends, sometimes from other cultures. That doesn't mean that we're not to be open to people. It doesn't mean that we're not to be gracious to people. But it does mean we need to stand strong in our faith. We need to stand strong in that in which we believe. And that's what Paul wanted from these early Christians was to stand strong. And you can stand strong by standing in the faith. And so he talks about uh, grace here in chapter 1 or verse 1. He talks about grace. And, you know, grace comes before peace, doesn't it? We have to experience and have the grace of God offered to us, offered to us prior to experiencing the peace of God. For by grace are you saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we put our trust in Christ, our faith in Christ, by the grace that he offers, and then comes the peace. In Philippians 4, 7 it says, The peace that passeth all understanding which shall Keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So it's important to realize what Paul is saying here. And then in verse 2, he talks about we give thanks to God always to you all. We give thanks to you all always. We're constantly, we're never ceasing to pray for you. To giving thanks to God for you. Why is he giving thanks to God? Why is he making mention of giving thanks to God for always praying for these people. He tells us right here, remembering without ceasing, your first of all, work of faith. Your work of faith. Your work of faith. They had faith. This morning, a question might be is, do we have faith? A question might be, how strong is our faith? A question might be, how far would we go with our faith? Their faith wasn't speculative. In other words, you didn't have to guess as to their faith. You didn't have to wonder if it was real. Their faith was sound. It was true. It was faithful. Just as it was with Moses. After Moses had his experience there at the burning bush. And he by faith trusted God. And ended up leading the Israelite children out of, Israel, out of Egypt. Rather. So their faith was real. It was sound. Their faith was operating faith. Their faith worked in other words. And we know from the book of James what the Bible says. The Bible says that faith and works are inseparable. That if you've got one, you've got to have the other. Their faith was energetic. What is energetic faith? Energetic faith is taking your faith to someone else. Taking the faith in which you have and what you've trusted by the grace of God and the grace that you live under in the era of grace which God gives you and I, we take it to somebody else. And we take it to somebody else for a purpose. 
And that purpose is not for our own good. It's not to get a pat on the back. It's not to get recognition. It is for the purpose and sole purpose of glorifying our Lord because of the death on the cross he gave through his son, Jesus Christ. There's a purpose for your faith. It's a working faith. Where is your faith? Is your faith a working faith? Is your faith an energetic faith? Are you really reaching out? Are you comfortable about coming and warming the pews and not doing anything other with your faith than that? No, Paul says to them, I thank my God every day for the faith that you have because it was a working faith. It was a sound faith. It wasn't speculative. It was an operating faith. It was an energetic faith, a faith that showed that you truly love the Lord, that your love for God was genuine. Paul told Timothy, hold on to your faith in good conscience because some have rejected this faith, Timothy. He said, hold on to your faith. You remember in the book of Acts what he said about many there in the book of Acts? He said, your faith is shipwrecked. I pray that your faith isn't shipwrecked this morning. But I want you to know that if your faith is shipwrecked, that Jesus Christ wants you to know that he's here to rescue you. That he's here to bring you back on board and to spare you and save you and to use you. That your faith might become that sound faith that he's talking about from the church of Thessalonica. That your faith might be that energetic faith. That your faith might be that faith that is operating faith. So where would you rate your faith on a scale of 1 to 10 this morning? Paul commended them for their hard labor then, he says, that come from this faith that they had in Jesus Christ. Yes, he says here in verse 2, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and then your labor of love. They labored, their work came out of love for Christ. Their faith come from this love in God. Labor of love, Paul said, I know it's prompted by love. Their love labored to fulfill the whole will of God. Their faith worked, but love can do more. Oh, what love can do. What love can do, my friends. How strong is your love for Christ this morning? Paul told the Corinthians, we labor ambitiously. That's what he told the Corinthian church and the believers at Corinth. He said, our love, our labor of work, our faith is ambitious. What was Paul referring to there? Paul was saying, what we do, we do, and some might call us crazy, but our hard labor of love is to God and for you. It is for the glory of God, it is for you, that we might energetically bring that faith to you, that you might trust in that faith, and by the grace of God that you might be saved, that for the glory of God you might become a part of the family of God. He says, what could cause such ambitious love there in Corinthians? What could cause such hard labor? What could cause such work for faith? What would cause it? Many people wondering and thinking, Paul is just absolutely crazy. Paul is a radical. Paul is just gone crazy about this thing in laboring for the Lord, of having this energetic faith. What could cause such a thing? And Paul revealed them that to their, in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul said, the love of Christ constraineth me. Do you get that? The love of Christ. The love of coming and dying on the cross of Calvary. Demonstrating the greatest love ever known to mankind. The love of Christ constraineth me. Out of the faith that I have in my Lord, to labor and to work and to energetically bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says in verse 6 here, then the patience of hope. He said, I know the pain that you bear being the Christians you are. I know the hardships that you suffer. I know the persecution that you're facing. I have faced them myself. And he goes through the scripture telling us about and you can read about Paul's life and how many times he suffered for the cause of the gospel out of his love and labor for Jesus Christ. He said, I know the strength you find to endure the trials you face. I know the life of blessings it produces. 
I know the good behavior that it brings. I know what the love of Christ can do. And I know it's out of this love of Christ that you're who you are. And that's who some of you are. is because of the love of Jesus Christ. That's why some of you do the things that you do. is out of the love of Jesus Christ. It's because the love of Christ constrains us to do that. It's the Holy Spirit of God that lives in us. That gives us a desire to want to do that. I was talking to a couple earlier this week. And we were talking about that very issue. And I've shared that with you on several different occasions. As to how we sometimes get to that place of dryness. Of how we sometimes get to that place of seeming to be burned. And nothing's going on and nothing's happening. As I shared with them and I have shared with you in times past. Don't wait until you get to that place to cry out to God. Do not wait until you get to that place. You know if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. You know if you have experienced the presence of God. You know that love of Christ in your life. You know the Holy Spirit's work in you. And when you begin to get away from that, when you begin to recognize it, when your conscience begins to reveal that to you, that is the Holy Spirit saying, you're distancing yourself from me. You need to get back on path because it's going to weaken your faith. You're going to fall to temptation. You're not going to be who you can be in me. You're going to shipwreck your faith. And don't go there. There's no need to go there if you would just stay close to me. If Paul was revealing this to them, I know the pain you bear. I know the strength you find to endure, the trials you face, the blessings it produces, the good behavior that it brings. He says, and the reason I know that is because you got what you got by the power of the Spirit. It wasn't nothing within you. It's nothing within me. It's all by the power of the Spirit of God that comes to dwell within us. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power in the Holy Ghost. Oh, in the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of God that's within us, the power of that we are equipped with as God's people to do the things that God wants done. The power of God that is in us to reach out to those that God wants to reach through our energetic way of life, being children of Christ. He says, this power in the Spirit turns one from idolatry. This power of Spirit will change your life. You and I, born-again believers, people that are under the blood of Jesus Christ, know that in their hearts. It changed your life. It changed my life. Many of you know me from before time. And I'm not the same person I used to be. God changed my heart. God changed my life. God changed my ways. God constrains me now out of his love to do those things for him that will bring glory to him. That's what he does to you. That's why you do what you do. You have experiences. Because the Holy Spirit has changed your life. Or has He? Has He changed your life? You know if He's changed your life or not. Sometimes it can be very evident when we have the marks of being an effective Christian. And sometimes not. Remember we read last Sunday about the pretenders? Those call themselves Christians but weren't. The Holy Spirit, the power of God, changes one's life, turns them from adultery, changes your life, develops in you a strong witness which brings glory to the Father. How strong is your witness today? That probes Christian perfection that is proof of the Spirit. That is proof of the Spirit. Is the proof of God's Spirit in you? Is the proof of God's Spirit in you? Is the proof of God's Spirit in me? Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy 1 7, he said, The Lord give us not 
the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. And from that come the characteristics and the marks of an effective Christian. Because he says the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and against such there is no law. Where is your spirit today? Marks of an effective Christian. The work of faith, the labor of love, the patience of hope, the power of the Spirit, he says here, has allied you to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Think about that. Think about that. Your work of faith, your labor of love, your patience of hope, your power of the Spirit has allied you to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. What's that mean, Pastor? That means you've been allied to heaven. You know how countries ally with one another? You've been allied to the kingdom of God. And there is no greater protector than the Lord Jesus Christ himself that we've allied ourselves with. The Holy Spirit, he says here, has put us on the suburbs of glory. We're right there. We're right there. Prior to getting into heaven, we're right at the suburbs of, suburbs of glory. God has allied us with himself. There is no greater reward. What has God's power done in your life since you first believed? What has God's power done in your life since you first believed? What is God's power doing in your life today? The Holy Spirit changes people for good when they believe and follow the gospel. The Holy Spirit doesn't just convict people of sin. Now, he's good about that. He's good about that. That's a part of his job is to convict us of our sin and to let us know when we're falling by the wayside, to let us know when we're getting off track, to let us know when we're going down the wrong path, to let us know that we're not where we belong. That is a part of his work because of his love for you. That's what he does. He brings conviction. But that's not all that he does. That's by far all he does. The Bible says here in the scriptures in verse 10, he assures us of the truth of the gospel. He assures us of the promises of God. He assures us of things that we can count on being what he says they'll be. And we don't have to second guess it. We don't have to think about it. No, he assures us of these things, the Bible says here. He assures us of the truth of the gospel. He assures us in verse 10, it says there, from the wrath of, to come. Aren't you glad this morning as a child of God that you aren't going to face the wrath of God? Amen. Now, there might be some judgment poured out on the United States of America. There might be some judgment that will even come your way because of being unfaithful to the Lord. But my friends, the Bible tells us this morning that the Spirit of God, the power of God that lives within you, gives you and I the assurance today that we will not experience the wrath of God. And I thank God, I praise God, that I will not experience the wrath of God. Amen. You will not want to experience the wrath of God. We're going through the book of Revelation on Sunday nights. We're going to be looking at uh, another part of verse 1 tonight. As I said, it, it's a little, it starts off a little slow, but it gets very intense. Very intense. And it talks over in the Bible about the seals and the vials and the trumpets being sounded. And it talks about the wrath of God. And you don't want to experience the wrath of God. And you and I that are born again believers, the Bible this morning says, by the power of the Spirit that lives in you and I, has the assurance, the promise of God not to experience the wrath of God. Thank God. Thank the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, sweet Holy Spirit of God. 
Thessalonians knew Paul very well. And they not only knew Paul, but they knew Silas. And they knew Timothy. They knew them by what they preached. And they not only knew them by what they preached, but they knew that what they preached was true. Was true. How did they know that what they preached was true? Because they lived it. They lived it. They had the marks of effective, of effective Christians. They had love. They prayed, said they had, they, they extended the grace of peace and through prayer continually practiced the work of faith, the labor of love, the patience of hope, the power of the Spirit themselves to these early Christians. And that's why they gave their hearts and lives to the Lord. Oh, yes, they lived what they preached. Does your life confirm or contradict what you say or believe today? Only you can answer that. I can put on a good show in front of you here. You can put on a good show in front of others here. But what are our lives like when we leave this place? How dedicated, how committed, how faithful are we to the Lord? Is our faith a work in faith? Is it a labor of love? Is it out of the patience of hope in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Is it by the power of the Spirit of God that lives within you? And Sister Lori, Brother Ronnie, Brother, Ron, Brother Kenny, Brother Roger comes this morning. What about you, friends? Does your life confirm or contradict what you say that you believe? Are you fervent in serving the Lord? Now, when he says that they were fervent and they were faithful in their labor for Christ, he didn't mean just faithful in church attending services. That wasn't what he was meaning. That's a part of it, but that's just a touch in the uh, uh, touch of the iceberg. Oh no, they, they serve the Lord outside the doors because that's where the mission is at. The mission is outside, friends. The mission is to those out there. That faith in which we labor for out of the love in which Christ constrains us by is to those that are outside. Those that don't know. Those that have never experienced the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. So again, does your life confirm or contradict what you say or believe? Are you firm in serving the Lord, knowing there is little time before He returns? You see, they were concerned about the return of the Lord. And Paul was just making conversation here in the sense of letting them know that the Lord had died and resurrected, and that was where their hope lie, that He was going to return. He wasn't emphasizing or stressing that it was going to be tomorrow. But we know from the Word of God, there are so many things throughout the Scriptures that God teaches us by the signs of the times. He said, how is it that you can tell by the east wind or the west wind, I forget which it is, when the weather's coming? How is it that you can tell this and tell that? But you can't tell the signs of the times which I have given you as children, which by the faith in which you live or that you claim to live in and by the power of the Spirit that you have that can reveal to you my word as to when things are going to happen. Not the exact moment, not the exact day, but I'll not leave you in the dark, he said. How is your work of faith, your labor of love, your patience of hope, and your power of the Spirit? Does your life confirm or contradict what you live? Maybe you just need to come talk to the Lord this morning. Maybe you need to come for prayer. Maybe you need to come and pray for somebody else. But my friends, if you're here this morning and you need for any reason whatsoever to spend a minute or two with the Lord, right now is the time to do it. Right now is as good a time 
It's the best time of the day is right now. As the sweet Holy Spirit is present here and He wants and He knows your heart. He knows your need. And all you've got to do is bring it to Him and lay it before Him and watch what He'll do with it. Let's stand as we sing 316. Stand with me and turn your Bibles to 316. 316. And you come. said something to you. I pray that throughout this week and share your faith with somebody. Do it with enthusiasm and do it energetically. Brother Tom, would you lead us a word of prayer? Just listen to us. I love prayer. 